Um, these are the specific, if you're looking at specific drugs rather than classes, these are the most prescribed drugs in, in long-term care. Okay, this is in Ontario, just to give you an idea. So furosemide is the most prescribed drug in the province. 27% of everybody in long-term care is on furosemide. Okay, it's about the same as the amount of people that are on acetaminophen, prescribed acetaminophen. We have uh, about 22% are prescribed althyroxine, so more than one-fifth of the province long-term care residents are being treated for hypothyroidism. Okay, Not, That doesn't mean everybody has hypothyroidism. Every, these are the people that are being treated for hypothyroidism, and you can sort of niggle about what, what is re the real diagnosis. Citalopram, you're talking about before, Benoit? Citalopram, about one-fifth of the population is on citalopram. Okay? So we did see that, you know, he had said that, that if you're going to pick an SSRI, that's probably the best. Somebody was listening to you, I don't know, maybe last year, maybe the year before. Atorvastatin, we're looking at. And, and I'm, not just, yeah, I'm just here to sort of present this. We can talk about the, the um, ramifications and a lot of the policy issues about this after. Uh, Ramipril and then senicides. So... Uh, of these, you know, these are, these are a lot of these are blockbuster drugs, as people know. Atorvastatin is coming on generic. It would be interesting to see what happens to that as it becomes genericized. But we're looking. Most of these, most of them are generic. A lot of them are evidence-based. Um, furosemide is symptom-based. There's no evidence that it improves mortality, um, and uh, probably symptom-based. But uh, you know, I'm sure that. Uh, it might be better if we, if we increase the amount of ramipril, for example, and decrease the amount of furosemide if these people, if for, the, for the treatment of congestive heart failure, for example. Important to realize how pervasive these drugs are. The beers list everybody always wants to talk about. The beers list, just to, to give you a little bit of history, it's, it's not named after beer. It has nothing to do with the alcoholic beverage. It's a, a person that started, it was named Mark Beers, started in 1991, and really, it's, it's, a, it's a consensus-based measure, okay? We've done, if you look out in the poster, we've done a few of these other things. Using a consensus-based process, bring people together that's informed by evidence, but at the end of it, there's experts sitting around a table and says, in, out, in, out, or in, under these circumstances, exclusion because of these circumstances. So that one drug, it's, it's not necessarily fair to say that this drug is totally forbidden, some of them are, but this drug in this context is not the best choice or is potentially inappropriate. Okay? The other interesting thing is that of the original list, most of them aren't, a lot of them aren't available in Ontario. A Canadian um, group has uh, updated these and we've modified this uh, with the Ontario Health Quality Council. So if you've looked on the Ontario Health Quality Council website, if you look some of the long-term care um, measures, you'll see some of these beers list criteria, and you'll see some of the background with that. So the drugs on the beers list, just to give you a feel, I'm not going to, I'm going to go through a lot of the, the um, I just want to go through a lot of the, the classes, give some examples, but for example, you know, people, the elderly, for example, should not be on meparidine which, or Demerol, okay? That's one of the things, there are alternatives to that use for, for control, because, um, and, and this is one of these uh, issues where people just sit around the table and say, I don't think that's a good idea. Amitriptyline, people say yes, but in blank or in blank, amitriptyline is right. Absolutely. As an antidepressant, amitriptyline may, um, is, is not considered as something else, for example, for pain syndromes, that might be a different choice. But you have to understand, so some of these are, are, are informed by the actual clinical situation. Um, clonidine, I don't think I've ever prescribed it, but that's on the list for, for an example. Some of the other drugs, diazepiramide, another drug that people don't really prescribe that much. Chlorpropamide is a sort of historical treatment for, for diabetes. I've actually seen one person on this. But these are drugs that you should you know, consider other, other, um, that, are, there are, might, that there will be better alternatives. So, for example, gastrointestinal drugs, hormone replacement therapy, um, respiratory drugs, for, an exa for example, stimulants, urinary drugs, and, uh, and others. There's always another phrase. In the States, um, if you look at the community dwelling elderly, this is more historical. In the 90s, about a fifth of the community dwelling elderly were on one of these drugs. 
A more recent study found that uh, if you're looking at elderly and nursing homes, uh, about a third to almost a half were on one of these drugs. Now, again, you have to distinct, disentangle that idea about being on a drug. You have to look at their, their definitions, being on the drug from being on the drug for, for clinically indicated or non-clinically indicated. And that's where it sometimes gets into a, a real battle when you, when you um, present these clinically. Sometimes doctors will say, yes, we tried X, Y, and Z, and this is the only thing that works. That's a, that's a different story. And, but, um, and that's why one of the ideas is not to necessarily aim the prevalence of the drugs to zero. There probably is a, a, a reasonable prescription for the drugs. It's probably lower than what we're at now. So in Ontario, the next thing, you're always wondering what Ontario, you always want to know what we're doing. This is in long-term care facilities. These are just, and again, the problem that we have sometimes with the data, as we said before, is it's hard to disentangle the clinical indication. We're just count, right, basically we're saying, was this filled at the pharmacy? Did the pharmacy charge the government and for what? Right? We're not saying this is, was tried or not tried. So if you look at any beers, I just gave the top six here, but if you look at any beers drug, we're looking at about 12% in Ontario. Okay? And, you know, you don't, it, so it, is that reasonable? I'm not sure. It's probably, it, but it could probably go down. Right? It's probably too high and it could probably go down. And part of it is identifying it. Part of it is how do you identify it. But if you don't know where you are at the beginning, you're not going to be able to lower it. You're not going to be able to improve the quality. If you don't know how good your quality is, you're not going to be able to improve your quality. So right now, some, you know, some of this stuff, for example, nitroferentoin, might, you know, there are other choices for antibiotics. Temazepam, there are other choices. So that, that's, and, that's, and we'll come back to this in a second where I'm going to say what can we do about it. But you have to, before you go anywhere, you have to know how you're doing and, how you, and where you can improve and where that, that spotlight is. Moving along, so we looked first at you know, what drugs we're prescribing. Maybe we're looking at some of the a bit of potentially inappropriate drugs for the beers list. Here we're looking at another measure of polypharmacy, um, another measure of quality prescribing. This is the, the concept that people are getting too many drugs, too many drugs, and... and um, Basically, as we know, the more drugs they get, the more side effects they can get. So really, there's a tension between evidence-based, if you look at guideline-based treatment, if you have more than two or three comorbidities, that's going to raise the amount of drugs you're supposed to be on. As I said, you know, evidence-based for congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, hypertension. If you want to get that hypertension under control, you need multiple therapies. And so there is that tension. However... Um, there is, a, there is that measure of pharm polypharmacy. It might be a little bit historic before, that we're, before the big shift to multiple drug therapies, but it's the concept of using nine or more drugs as a measure of polypharmacy. It's crude. It's dichotomous. It's recognized as such, but it's a measure. So you have to just consider it, and just you know, we can argue about it after for sure. Basically, when we looked at this in Ontario, long-term care facilities... About 15% of, Ontario, of residents at Ontario uh, long-term care facilities were concurrently dispensed nine or more drug therapies. And this is, this is um, data that uh, Susan Bronskill was the PI on at ISIS. Among these individuals, 2%, so not a huge amount, received 13 or more drug therapies. And we're not even considering the PRN dosage here. We're considering like regular drug therapies. PRN is at a different level. Few residents, so if you can think of it, you know, it's few and far between. I go back in time and think of who isn't on any drugs, okay? Very few are on no drugs. So about 80%, so that middle, are dispensed between one and eight drugs. So most people are prescribed less than nine drugs, nine regular drugs, at any one time. This is in long-term care. About 15% are, are prescribed more than 13, more than nine, I'm sorry. Um, the top subclasses, this is... If people are on more than nine meds, here are the, the drug classes that people are getting. Diuretics, you know, you don't have to be, you can, I, even before I put up the slide, I'm sure you could guess this just from everything else that we had before. Diuretics, so if you're getting, if, if you're getting more than nine drugs, a diuretic is probably on your list. PPI is probably on your list. An ACE inhibitor is probably on your list. And then the other drugs, you know, most, more than one-third are getting at least calcium channel blockers. SSRI is about 
So there, there seems to be a lot of drugs that are going together, that are in a sense collinear. So a lot of antihypertensives, PPIs seem to be prescribed to most people, and, uh, and um, both SSRIs and uh, benzodiazepines seem to be going, they're almost collinear. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong way. The interesting thing that we took from this is not just the descriptive part. What we did was we tried to see if we link this or if we, we, if we compare this measure of nine plus medications to other measures like the beers list, like the rates of antipsychotic use, which people would say certain at the facility level. We're not looking at the individual level. So what you say is at your facility level, what's your percentage of people who are on antipsychotics? At the facility level, what is the percentage of people who are on more than nine medications? At the facility level, what are the percentage of people who have a beer's drug? And then you take all these, you take all the facilities, you put them out on a, on a scatter plot, and you look at how they're linked to each other. What we found is that they tended to cluster. The, people, the facilities that had higher proportions of beer's prescriptions also had higher proportions of antipsychotic prescriptions, also had higher proportions of people prescribed more than nine drugs. The, per the facilities that had lower beers prescription had lower risk of antipsychotic, had lower prevalence of antipsychotic prescription, and also had lower risk of uh, beers drugs. So even after controlling for these, for a whole host of factors, your odds ratio is about two for more likely to receive a, a, a a beer's drug therapy at, with high facility, um, high uh, level uh, rates of other uh, quality things. So you're, I'm not here, so I used to be one of these guys who would always bring bad news. We're doing terribly, we're doing terribly, we're doing terribly. That, that's not really what we're here for, right? How are we going to improve these things? The first step, as I said, is to know how you're doing, and then you can start the interventions. Interventions often aren't very easy to do, right? One of the things which we've been trying to, we've been involved in, and I think Norm has also been involved in, is really the collaborative of looking at beers list drugs as the first stage to improving the quality of drug prescription in the province in long-term care. What we also recognize is that it's not only a problem of long-term care, it's when these people are coming into long-term care. I didn't prescribe the benzodiazepine, they did that in the hospital. I didn't prescribe the antipsychotic, they did that in the community two years ago. I'm not going to take them off their antipsychotic when they come in. How can we look at it? First, we have to sort of come up with a list of drugs. First, we have to come up with some measures. And we also have to come up with a, a concept. So, uh, and this has um, really been spearheaded by both um, Paul and Eves and uh, Chris uh, from um, the ISMP. It's a three-year mar social marketing campaign. We've developed consensus among key stakeholders and common messages. We've started off with the beers list, but we're not finishing. That's just the start. That's... That's, um, we're working with a whole host of people, including the pharmacies. The nice thing about long-term care, as I told you before, as I said before about the 600 physicians, interestingly, there aren't that many pharmacies that supply to long-term care. So by getting the six or seven large pharmacies that distribute to long-term care on board, it's much easier than getting in the community, the individual community pharmacies on board. So if you have those people on board, as part of your intervention, it'll be, it'll be much, it, it, we hope it would be much easier to sort of close that gap. And then we want to reduce the list of potentially inappropriate uh, medications in the long-term homes. That's our, that's our goal.